Hello, everybody, and welcome to another online lecture for general chemistry. And in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about Hess's Law. And Hess's Law is one of two major ways we learn how to solve for enthalpy, which is delta H, when we are in general chemistry one. Now, there's a couple other ways we can solve for enthalpy that we'll learn in general chemistry two. But for right now, it's Hess's Law and standard enthalpy formations. And Hess's Law is the one we're going to take a look at today. So let's go ahead and get started with Hess's Law. So hopefully you remember from previous lessons that enthalpy is really talking about the heat involved in reactions. So when we have bonds forming, bonds breaking, we're dealing with changes in heat. We've talked about endo and exothermic in regards to delta H. And Hess's Law is one of two ways that we are going to examine in General Chemistry 1 for how we can actually uh, determine delta H when we want a delta H for a given reaction. So the easiest way to start showing Hess's Law is with a very generic example. So the example that we're going to show here is not a specific chemical reaction. We're just going to use A, B, C, and D for our reagents and products. And then you can associate a delta H with each one of these reactions. And this will give you the general overview of Hess's Law. This is a very simple example. And then we're going to look at one in more detail so you guys can get some practice with it. Um, so if you take a look here, I have a reaction of interest at the top. And it says reactant A plus 2 of reactant B goes to 2 reactant D. So again, imagine this is some sort of a balanced equation that I'm looking at. Uh, and it's a reaction of interest. And I want to find the delta H of this reaction. I want to find the enthalpy of the reaction or the change in heat. And so if this is not available, and sometimes you can't necessarily find a delta H directly for the reaction of interest, you can use a set of subsequent reactions, you can sum their enthalpies up together, and then that will give you the enthalpy of the new reaction. So you can see below it. Let's say that I can't directly go from A plus 2B over to 2D. But what I can do is say, I know that A plus 2B is going to give me some product C. And that reaction has a given delta H associated with it. And we're going to call that delta H1. And then we're going to say, I also know that C will decompose into two moles of D, and that given reaction is going to have a delta H that we'll refer to as delta H2. And what I can do is I can align these two equations together, and sort of like when we had spectator ions in net ionic equations that sort of got crossed out, here we can see that C is on the right of the first reaction and on the left of the second reaction. And so there is no C in the net reaction here. What we end up with is A plus 2B goes to 2D, and delta H1 plus delta H2 will give me the delta H of the overall reaction, which we can call delta H3. And so delta H3 is the delta H of the reaction of interest, but the way that I get to it is by summing through several sub-reactions. And I end up with the final reaction of interest as well as the final delta H of interest. So hopefully that makes sense in this, uh, again, simple generic example. So let's go ahead and look at a real example in just a minute. But there's three things that I want to point out that become important when we're doing Hess's Law. So it's important you know these before you try a real example. Sometimes, in the previous example, everything aligned perfectly. So I was able to cross out what I needed, sum everything together, and we were at the final reaction of interest. But there are several things you may need to do sometimes in order to get your reaction of interest out of the sub-reactions. And you're allowed to manipulate these reactions. So keep several things in mind while you're performing Hess's Law manipulations. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. Okay, Number one. Any compound found on the right side of one equation and the left side of the other equation can cancel out in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that means, just like C was in the previous example, I found one mole of C on the right and then one mole of C on the left, and so they could cancel out with each other in a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, that's number one, and that one we saw. Number two, you can multiply through with your equation. So if you multiply through any equation, you must also multiply through the delta H by that value. So let's say, for instance, that I only have one C 
on the right hand side of the reaction, but I have two C's on the next reaction on the left hand side. I would need to multiply my first reaction through by two in order to get the moles of C to match in a mole to mole ratio. And so when I do that, if I'm going to multiply through by two, I'm also going to need to multiply everything through by two, which includes doubling or multiplying by two for my delta H when I get to that point. Okay, so make sure if you're going to multiply through, which does occur fairly often, that you're also multiplying through on your delta H when it gets summed into the final delta H equation. And number three, if a chemical equation needs to be reversed, the sign on delta H should also be reversed. So in other words, if I have a reaction and I need to flip it so that two things will cancel out in the reaction above, right? If I flip my reaction, I'm also flipping the entire process, and so the sign on my delta H should flip. So anything that's endothermic becomes exothermic if I flip the equation, and anything that becomes exothermic would become endothermic if I flip the equation. So again, I'm not really flipping anything with the numbers, but I am flipping the positive or negative that gets associated with that number if I'm flipping the reaction. Okay, so those are the three major things. You can cancel out on the left and the right. You need to multiply through if you're gonna do that for the delta H as well. And then if I'm gonna flip any of the equations, I need to make sure that when I do flip it, I'm also going to flip the sign associated with the enthalpy for that equation. All right, so hopefully those make sense. I'm gonna bring up an example here. And after we go through this example, I'm gonna give you guys a practice one, uh, and then I'll put the answers up like normal. So. Let's take a look at this equation here. So I have an equation of interest at the top, and it is three moles of solid carbon plus four moles of H2 gas are going to go to C3H8 gas, which is propane gas, the type of gas you would find in a camping stove, okay? So solid carbon and hydrogen gas produce propane gas. That's the equation of interest here. So this is the equation I want to target. This is the one I want to find the delta H for. Now, what I'm going to do is use several reactions that have known delta H's in order to obtain my reaction of interest that's at the top here. So let's take a look at these three. I have propane gas plus five moles of oxygen going over to three moles of carbon dioxide plus four moles of water vapor, it's H2O gas. That has a delta H associated with it of minus 2043 kilojoules. Okay, the second equation, solid carbon plus oxygen gas, is going to go to carbon dioxide gas. This has a delta H of minus 393.5 kilojoules. And then finally, my third equation, two moles of hydrogen gas plus a mole of oxygen gas goes to two moles of water vapor, a delta H of minus 483.6 kilojoules. So the question is, you have all this stuff, it looks a little overwhelming. Where do you start with this? Well, the way that I like to start is just how I balance my equations. I go up to my reaction of interest and I say, what is the first thing I need to target here? And if I take a look, I say, okay, the first thing of interest in this equation to me is the solid carbon and I need three moles of it. So it needs to have three moles and it also needs to be found on the left hand side of my final equation because it's a reactant right here. So I go through my three known reactions and I say, where can I find this? So I look at reaction one, is there any solid carbon there? No. I look at reaction two, is there any solid carbon there? Yes, there is. Over on the left-hand side, I find solid carbon. And so if I keep it on the left-hand side, it'll end up on the left-hand side when I sum through with all this. So that means the carbon is in the correct position. Now the question is, do I have the correct amount of it? Well, my target equation has three carbons that are solid. We're talking about moles when we're looking at the stoichiometric ratios. And down here, when I look at this one, I only have one. So I need to multiply through by three in order to get three carbons in the final reaction. And if I'm gonna multiply by three, I need to multiply this delta H by three. And so I'm gonna put three times negative 393.5. And if you solve for that, you find that that is equal to negative 1,181 kilojoules. Okay, so once we have that, we need to go to the next one. 
So I have the carbon set. Now I need to find hydrogen gas. So again, I move down through each of the individual equations looking for hydrogen gas, and I'm going to want it on a reactant side. So I look at the first equation, no hydrogen gas. I look at the second equation, no hydrogen gas. But I get to the third equation, I find hydrogen gas, and I find it on the left-hand side of the equation here. That's perfect because my hydrogen gas needs to be a reactant in the final equation. It needs to be on the left-hand side. And so I take a look at this and I say, is it the correct amount? Well, in the target equation, I need four moles of that hydrogen gas. I only have two moles when I look at this subreaction here. So when I get ready to solve this subreaction, I'm going to need to multiply through by two because that'll give me a total of four. So if I multiply through by two, I'm going to take this equation, multiply everything, all the reactants, all the products through by two, and I also have to multiply my delta H through by two. And so I'm going to take two times the negative 483.6, and that's going to come out to negative 967.2. And so now that hydrogen should be set up in the final equation. And the last thing I need to go in and find is the propane gas. And the propane gas needs to be a product. So I go through my reactions like I've been doing. I get to reaction one and I already find the propane gas. But this time it's on the left-hand side and I need it on a right-hand side. It has to end up as a product, not a reactant. So what I need to do here is flip this equation. So I'm gonna flip it and then that's also going to flip the sign on the delta H. It does not change the value of delta H, but it changes the sign associated with that delta H value. So we take this and instead of negative 2043, it becomes positive 2043. And now I have a mole of propane on the product side. Now, do I have the proper amount? Yes, because if I look at my uh, target equation, I have one mole of the propane and I now have one mole of propane down at the bottom of this flipped reaction over on the product side. So it's perfect, it's all set up. After all that work, we can finally go through and we can sum all of these up, we can get rid of anything that can cancel out and we will sum together all the delta H's. So if we set that up, let's set up what we have here, including all the new signs, all the manipulations. This is what we would end up with. And as we go through, we can see the carbon dioxides cancel, the water vapors cancel, and the oxygen moles cancel. Now notice for the oxygen moles, those are split between two equations. So I have 5O2 on the top, and then these other two, I split it between three of them in the second equation and two of them in the third equation. But they sum together to give me five on the left, five on the right, so those cancel. So I go through. If I sum all this up, I'm going to say all of those cancel, and I get my target reaction, three carbon plus four hydrogen gas goes to one mole of the propane. And that makes sense if I add all these and sum this together. And then if I sum all the delta H's together, I'm taking positive 2043 plus a negative 1181 plus a negative 967.2. And so what I net when I finish that is negative 105 kilojoules. And so that is the delta H of my target reaction. I have now solved delta H for the original reaction of interest through a series of subreactions. Okay, so if you're having trouble with this, rewind the video, go through and look at each of those individual manipulations and how we did that. So there's a couple examples. We have the canceling, we have the multiplying through of some of these, and we also have uh, that last one we did. We reversed the equation and changed the sign. Okay, so this is how you would do this one. So I'm going to flash an example up on the screen here. So here it is. This is your target equation. Here are the sub equations that you have to work with. And your job is going to be to find the delta H of the target reaction through manipulating these in any fashion necessary. So go ahead and try this, pause the video, and then we'll put the answer up in a minute. Okay, welcome back. So this again was our uh, problem that we had here. So what I'm going to do now is next to it, I'm going to flash up the answer. And the answer is basically going to be what needed to happen to each of these reactions. So here is what you needed to do for each of these reactions. Hopefully this is what you got. 
if you performed this correctly, then all of these should cancel out and you should end up with your target delta H value, which is right here. So hopefully this made sense. If you have any trouble, feel free to leave comments in the comments section. Um, other than that, thank you very much for watching. I hope this video was helpful in your learning process. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for all the latest updates. And I will see you guys for the next video where we will be discussing the standard enthalpy formations.